Welcome back to another episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some stories about agriculture and the future of the industry, as well as an interesting article talking about a new cancer treatment that utilizes the same technology that was used in the COVID-19 vaccine by Pfizer and Moderna. And of course, we will end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive, ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling from me. Let's jump into our daily debate. So when you think about the future of farming, what do you picture? Maybe some people who are aware of the changing climate that we're experiencing. Maybe you see dried up fields. Maybe you see overutilized fields. But when I picture it, I picture hydroponics. And if you've listened to some of my Twitter tirades over on Twitter, you'll know that I did my senior thesis on hydroponics back in the day. So it is very important to me, this topic, or at least it is something that I cared about then. I can't honestly say that I pursued it much further than that, but it was something really interesting looking at the ancient agricultural systems and how we use some of these same techniques in hydroponics nowadays. But there's a totally different vision for the future of agriculture. And there are two opposing articles that I have here for you. One that talks about what we can do in order to increase our productivity going into the future, and another one that talks about the massive crop failures that are on the way. So I honestly, I want to start with the negative one that comes from Gizmodo. It's about the crop failures. And then we can talk about the second one that tells us how we can use more automated processes, different techniques, and really increase the productivity on our farm. So we can start with the negative and then end with the positive one about agriculture and then we'll jump into that cancer article last. So like I said, this first one comes from Gizmodo. The title is A Wake-Up Call. The world needs to prepare for massive crop failure. So if you are one of those eco-conscious people that I was talking about earlier, you are probably more scared about this than some other people. You've probably read the articles. You've heard the talking points about how we're going to experience massive crop failure. I'm not trying to dispel that. I want to highlight this article because even if I don't agree with every single point, it's still possible that we need to understand the negatives, the worst case scenario that could happen if we don't change something. Or we need to at least have these conversations so that we can understand a possible outcome. Now, this is not the 100% outcome. Predicting the future when it comes to agriculture or any of these different industries is almost impossible. There are a million different factors. For all we know, an asteroid could hit the Antarctica in the next few weeks and send up so much ice particles or different ash particles into the atmosphere or a volcano could erupt and send up ash particles and it could completely cool down the Earth for two or three years because of the amount of ash that is spewed into the atmosphere. Or we could have a new product where we actually, like Bill Gates is trying to do, go up and put different chemicals in the atmosphere to increase the reflectivity of our atmosphere to make sure that harmful rays and radiation don't break through. Or, uh, completely inverse, we could build thousands upon thousands of seawalls or desalination plants. And these rising sea levels could actually be for a way for us to utilize them in some way, shape, or form in order to have more water for our agricultural areas or use them for tidal power since the ocean levels will be higher and therefore those waves will probably be larger. There are lots of different ideas and there are lots of different possibilities and these sort of models can't take all of those into account, but this is something that we need to consider. Quote, the climate crisis has changed weather patterns, and this could increase crop failure in multiple agricultural regions around the world, a new study says. In a report published in Nature Communications this week, researchers in the U.S. and Germany outlined how food production regions of the world will see significantly lower crop yields in the near future. The researchers analyzed climate models and observational data from 1960 and 2014 and then looked at future projections between 2045 and 2099. 
By analyzing the data, they found that a changing jet stream has contributed to crop failure in the past. Jet streams are air currents that change weather patterns around the world. But many scientists have observed that climate change is changing how jet streams move, which could challenge crop growth regions around the world. Climate models are equipped to show those changes in the atmosphere, but these models cannot always show how it affects the conditions on the ground, end quote. So they speak about this here, how these models are not perfect and we can't ascertain everything from them. So how do we combat this? In my opinion, hydroponics and not just outdoor hydroponics that could still be affected by inclement weather, but we do large indoor or underground hydroponics facilities that enable us to very meticulously control what goes in to the nutrition profile of each plant, what goes into the different things that we're feeding them, what kind of water we use. And then we could also recycle that water so we don't have to worry about draining the aquifers as fast. Now, let's be clear. I do understand that hydroponics has a long way to go, and we don't necessarily know everything about it. But as I mentioned in the Twitter tirade, imagine that you have a acre field. And in order to get double the amount of crops, because you're already producing at the max efficiency, you're already using the best manure, you are already tending to your crops the best way you can, and you have the maximum efficiency in that one acre. But you want to produce double the amount of crops. How do you use that acre? You can't buy the acres next to you. You can't go out and expand the farm because your, your neighbors own everything right next to you. They're not willing to lend it out to you either. What do you do? Well, you build up, you go up, you make a more vertical system. Now you can have two acres worth of farm on the space that would be one acre worth of farm. Now we may get really deep into it and someday you may have to buy air rights or uh, I don't know what they necessarily call them in New York, but basically different companies or that are trying to build large skyscrapers, they actually have to buy the rights to the air above the building or around the building in order to restrict people from building around it. So in the future, they may have to do the same thing with hydroponics. You have to buy the rights to not just the land, but also the air above it. But still, imagine how much more efficient we could be with the same amount of land. And you could have a trickle-down system where you put water in at the top and then constantly put in some more minerals or different necessities for the different crops, and it could trickle all the way down to the bottom. Now, this is me being utopic, let's be clear. We obviously, as I mentioned before, we haven't figured everything out when it comes to hydroponics. How do you replenish water if it's all sucked up by the plant? Do you have to have injection spots halfway through? Do you have to vary the amount of water week to week? There are lots of different theories and lots of different suggestions that go into this. But I think it is a viable, viable solution because you can cordon off these things kind of like greenhouses and then you don't have to worry about these jet streams like this article is talking about. Because if we can't actually predict, the models can kind of show, well, hey, the jet stream may do this. But like I said before, there are uns unseen conditions that will come up, obviously. And they can't even predict the what's going to happen on the ground, the, the circumstances on the ground caused by the jet stream. So not only can we not accurately or 100% expect what the jet stream will be, but also we can't even 100% say what the jet stream will do. So why would we take the risk? Why would we bet everything or change our habits based on predictions that are built on more predictions versus creating a self-contained unit that could regulate itself or, in theory, be regulated by a minimal crew or staff and not have to worry about these things? And also the reason I think this is beautiful is because it creates a new industry. It creates room for innovation. Companies can now take advantage of the fact that more people want these self-contained systems. Maybe you could have one that is for commercial use, and then you also have one that's for individual use. And then by creating a market, by the government maybe subsidizing it or just taking off some restrictions and regulations in the first few years and allowing this industry to grow, you can actually have free market incentives in place in order to have companies that focus solely on hydroponics. And they're already out there, but imagine a consumer hydroponic center. Imagine you just have a shelf in your house and on the top row, you grow tomatoes. The second row, you grow, I don't know, asparagus. On the third row, you grow small strawberries. 
Imagine you can have a self-contained shelf just in your house that does all the growing for you. And then you could even adjust all the settings based on what you want to grow. And then you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about times of year either. Because if you can simulate light and different weather conditions, then you could grow anything year round. And this is probably what you would have to do in an underground bunker where people may stay if things go a little bit crazy. If the environmental changes happen more rapidly than we see them happening and things go downhill, they may be underground bunkers where people are waiting for things to change above ground and you have hydroponic self-contained systems that are doing all this regulation and you can grow something that would be really fertile in the Mediterranean and then maybe you want to switch it up. Maybe you want a certain type of rice that is really only grown in humid air in East China. You can completely change the atmosphere or the conditions within that biosphere and then produce rice. I mean, there are limitless possibilities here, but the reason that I have to bring them up and the reason that I'm pushing hydroponics so hard is because Gizmodo's saying, hey, we don't know what's going to happen here and we should be prepared for it. And before there's this whole robust hydroponics market, we need to acknowledge things are going to change here on the ground or they have a possibility of doing so. So farmers need to get ready for this. Quote, the study explains that under a high emission scenario, a strongly meandering jet stream or a wavy jet stream could actually trigger some of these lower crop yields worldwide. Data showed the researchers that years with more than one wave event often led regional crop yields to drop by 7%. They also found that agricultural regions in Eastern Europe, East Asia, and North America were likely to be impacted by these events. The study reinforced or referenced a heat wave that significantly hurt agriculture in Russia back in 2010. The high temperatures that year were connected to a shift in jet stream, according to researchers. Russia's heat wave destroyed 9 million hectares or 22,239,484 acres of crops, end quote. Now, you can see why this is important that we at least keep this in mind before we can have a robust system, before we can have solutions as pies in the sky as mine. We have to keep this in mind. That is a lot of crops, and that's just in one country. Imagine if that happens in every single major developed country or one that has a robust agriculture sector. Imagine what will happen. We're already seeing supply chain issues because of what's happening in Ukraine, which is the breadbasket of Europe, basically. Imagine if this happens here in America. We are also one of the breadbaskets of the world. We produce a lot of food. Imagine if we lost over 22 million acres of crops. We wouldn't have feed to feed the cows, the pigs, the chickens. So then they would also increase the prices of meat and the availability of meat and things like this. Or you imagine when farmers have extra crops left over that they can't actually feed to their pigs, they may turn it back into manure or some sort of fertilizer, natural fertilizer, so they can put it on their plants next year. Well, now the fertilizer costs may go up. There are lots of contingencies here, and a lot of this sector is very tightly interconnected. The food sector is very tightly woven together. They use a lot of byproducts from one another. Like I said, they use some of this bad corn as feed for cows. Guess where they use for some of the fertilizer? They use cow manure. So, and let's be clear, a lot of it is synthesized. I'm fully aware of that, but some people use natural cow manure. So, like I said, very, very entangled industry, and a crop failure like this could have wide-ranging effects, not just here in the United States, but across the entire world. So this is why we have to take it seriously. So I did the whole doom and gloom. Now let's move on to an article that discloses how people, mainly farmers, can take advantage of new technologies in order to increase their productivity and change how efficient their processes are. So this one comes from the World Economic Forum, The Rise of Autonomous Farms, How Technology is Revolutionizing Agriculture. And I will start by saying this article started off really nice. And it's like, oh, yeah, you can use these technologies in a certain way. And then it started talking about having cameras and different programs to monitor how much each different plant is actually fertilized or what different processes are going into making sure that plant is fertile and is going to survive and produce the most yield for the farmer. 
and it slowly gets more into these heavy monitoring systems that report back to non-centralized lo- the to centralized locations and how farmers have to pay for subscriptions rather than have their own facilities and data analytics all in one location, but they're rather going to refer to other companies that will do it for them. And as we slowly went through it a little bit more, I was like, this is kind of, this is getting kind of creepy. This is kind of centralizing control in bigger businesses. And these businesses are basically telling farmers how to do their job. Like, what's going on here? And then I looked at the very top. I was like, oh, it's from the World Economic Forum. That makes sense. Because, you know, the World Economic Forum, they want to control everything. They want it to all be centralized. They want everybody to send their data to their partners. And then their partners will determine what we can do in our lives and how we can interact with the world around us. But that doesn't mean that what they're saying here doesn't have some value. And some of these technologies could still be adapted without the heavy monitoring and control that they're trying to emphasize here. Quote, the agricultural industry is under pressure. Dramatic cost increases for inputs and labor are putting farmers' profitability at risk. Globally, farmers report the prices for inputs such as fertilizer and crop protection chemicals have risen by 80 to 250 percent over the past few years. Climate change is also squeezing profits. A warmer climate is resulting in increased weather variability. More frequent acute weather events, long droughts, and new invasive crops and pests, all of which reduce yields. In the American Southwest, for example, an ongoing mega drought has been so severe that the past two decades have been the region's driest in the last 1,200 years. End quote. So you see, they're starting on the exact same note here, which is supply chain issues are causing prices to go up. Like I talked about how the industry is so entangled and everybody feels the pain when one part of the industry isn't doing well or there's a a holdup. And then also talking about the climate change issues that are affecting a lot of the farmers. Quote, next generation technologies are a combination of sensors, analytics, robots, and equipment to help farmers make smarter decisions on the field and do more with less. In addition, recent developments in generative AI present future opportunities to automate decision-making using vast data sets that already exist. Potential examples include helping farmers develop strategic plans about what inputs, fertilizer, crop protection, and seeds to apply at what times and what rates to best support a farm's profitability and sustainable practices. So you can see here that they're talking about having it be automated. And basically, the farmer is just going to be a person who steps in and fixes the machine. Think Interstellar. You know how Cooper has those large, large uh, machines that go out and they just do most of the work for him. And then there's a magnetic disturbance and he has to go out and fix them. And he's basically more of an engineer. He's more of a handyman than he is the direct operator of what's going on on the farm. Now, this does sound a little bit scary, having a lot of the choices outsourced to an AI system. But still, it wouldn't necessarily have to just be an AI. The farmer could input commands throughout the day and still use that sensor data and all the different allocation data based on, oh, well, hey, this uh, crop sprayer, it sprayed this much here. Maybe I should send it over for a second pass. The farmer could still step into that process and make decisions about what should go on on his farm, and it wouldn't have to be sent out to an AI to make all those decisions. But it could be if the farmer wanted it to. I think that would be very derelict considering a farmer, though the AI can gather a whole bunch of information and understand how things have worked, maybe a farmer has dealt with difficult situations or unique circumstances in their area that the AI hasn't been trained to deal with. So we should always have that human component there because also maybe there's a creativity or creative pattern or a creative practice that is based on a pattern that the AI can't necessarily recognize that the farmer could take advantage of. So completely removing the human aspect from this, it is scary, but also I think it's it's dangerous because there is something that humans provide that AI can never provide. And also a good amount of oversight to make sure that the AI isn't... Because, okay, let's think about it this way. If the AI sees that, oh, putting extra manure on this crop actually upped my yields by 25%, but then it doesn't notice that, hey, actually my corn, though the yields went up, I got more ears of corn. Each one is actually less nutritious. 
then it's not going to take that into account unless it can test the nutrition of the corn. And maybe the farmer is more aware of this than the AI. The AI is just looking at the raw numbers. Oh, one, two, three, four. Okay, we got four years of corn here. Well, obviously my practice worked, so we're going to keep moving forward. But then you send that corn off to the market and people don't want to buy it because it's not as nutritious, it's not as healthy. So then it gets sent off to the animals like cows and pigs and be put in their feed and the farmers get less money for it. So there are certain aspects of this that the AI can't fully take advantage of or there may be patterns or false patterns, you know, kind of like AI hallucinations that the AI will assume are good even though the outcome isn't as good. So you can't have it be purely mechanical. You still have to have that interpreter in there. And even if the AI is able to fully account for the nutrition of the corn, maybe it is inefficient or it is not as cost effective to use that extra manure on that piece of corn because the price of corn has changed or the price of manure has changed. And unless you have these AI systems completely connected to the internet, which I highly doubt a lot of farmers are going to want to do because that means that their data is being shared directly with either the company that is providing the software or maybe the government to have a overall tally of what's going on on all the farms. I highly doubt farmers are going to want that to happen because that's scary. That's centralizing of control. So we need to have this idea implemented in a way that farmers can still keep control over their farm. And that's why it is a little bit scary when you read some of this stuff, but it is also inspiring because these technologies can still help farmers get more from less. And I think that is a beneficial thing at the end of the day. And maybe a few farms, maybe there should be a few test farms where they try this out. They can have farmers come into these different test farms, see how the process works. And if they don't like how it works, they can steal what they want. Maybe they want drones to disperse their seeds across the fields. This is something that you could have drones do because you can program a flight path in them. And then they could drop the seeds. They could drop different pesticides on different plants and things like that. But maybe they don't want the AI system that takes control over that. Or maybe they want the scanners that tell them where they haven't applied the pesticide evenly, but they don't want a automated robot to go do that because it may be a little heavy-handed or maybe the farmer wants to do it in a very particular way. So you could steal different aspects of this system in order to make it work and not be as controlling as it does appear when you first read about it. So let's talk about the input cost and how it could cut down on them a little bit. Quote, supply chain disruptions and geopolitical challenges have pushed up prices widely for fertilizer. And the examples they give here are urea, dimonium phosphate, and potash by more than 15% over the past five years. In a McKinsey survey last year, U.S. farmers ranked input costs as the number one risk to their profitability, with the price of fertilizers and crop protection chemicals rising the most. And they have a few charts here that highlight whether they think it's the highest cost to them, the average price of the different fertilizers mentioned above, and also the projection of the farmers as to whether the price will continue to go up. And the interesting one here is 60% of respondents of farmers say that they expect a 10 to 20% increase in the price of their input costs within the next 12 to 18 months. Imagine if that is year on year, you have a 10 to 20% increase. The price of corn is going to go up like crazy, which will also affect the price of beef. That's insane. Quote, automation can help reduce these costs by enabling farmers to use pesticides and fertilizers more efficiency. efficiently. For example, automated precision spraying enabled by sensors and field data, both stored and in real time, can sense gaps between crops and adjust the volume and timing of chemical spraying according accordingly using fewer chemicals, end quote. And what I have a problem with here is stored versus real time. Yes, stored could be useful if you can store it locally, but if it's real time, that's what I would prefer, and then it's run on RAM rather than hard SSD, and then you can just have it, oh, okay, wow, I'm looking at this right now. I missed this row of crops. They only got 25% as much. Let's spray a little bit more there. And then after they're done running that process, they delete the data and it's not sent out. Because once again, 
I do find the overarching narrative here from the World Economic Forum, which is give us as much data as possible. Not necessarily the World Economic Forum, but give as much data as possible. Have it outsourced to the cloud. Have it outsourced to large groups that can tell you what the best practice is and dictate how you should run your farm. That's the only thing that I find really scary. I've mentioned it a few times. I'm probably sounding like a worn out record, but it is extremely, extremely scary. That doesn't mean the practices can't be useful, but just keep it in mind when you do read something like this, which talks about overarching centralized control across an entire industry. It's scary and it should be scary to you. And if it's not, you know, it's just my opinion, but I think you're missing part of the point. And I would want you to go read this entire article and then leave a comment telling me whether you think I'm crazy or not. Because when I hear this, the paranoid side of me is like, no, 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 too much control, too much control, too much control. Or maybe it's just because it's the World Economic Forum and I don't trust those guys anyway. All right, let's jump to our last story that comes from New Atlas mRNA Trojan horse tricks cancer into making toxins to kill itself. So you may know of the mRNA kind of model, which was used by Pfizer and Moderna to alter how your body handles the production of different proteins. It would force your body, in the case of the vaccine, to make spike proteins, and then that would kind of simulate what COVID would be like, so your body would at least have a pre-prepared immune response ready if you were to get infected by those different spike proteins in the case of coronavirus. Well, they're using the same technology and they're injecting it into cancer cells to have it eat away at itself, basically, which is very interesting. Quote, scientists have developed and tested a new potential treatment for cancer that works in a similar way to the COVID-19 vaccines. The technique involves delivering mRNA molecules to cancer cells in tricking them into producing toxic proteins to kill the tumor. Inside all living cells are ribosomes, which are essentially a tiny factory that produce proteins. As exactly which proteins they make depends on the blueprint they receive, and these come from the messenger RNA, or mRNA molecules. Over the past few decades, scientists have found that they can hijack this mechanism to make beneficial proteins on demand. Quote, such since then scientists have turned their sights onto cancer, experimenting with using mRNA to produce proteins that mimic those made by the tumors, helping to launch an immune response against the cancer. This could be particularly promising when paired with other treatments like immunotherapy. So this is something that's very interesting, and we have seen conversations about this type of solution to cancer before where they would inject different cancer cells with different types of viruses, and then the body would actually attack those cells because they saw, okay, hey, hey, there's this virus present in these cells. We need to get rid of them. We need to respond by destroying them so that they don't spread the virus into the rest of the body. And we've seen this sort of thing before, basically trying to trick our body into destroying cancer. We'll see how far this research goes. I think it is very, very interesting. What I always find scary or a little bit tricky is the fact that we're actually tricking our body into creating different proteins. Now, I can't remember the exact disease, and I'm really, really sad that I can't, but there is a disease that also hijacks the ribosomes and makes them create proteins that are not healthy for your body. So imagine if there's another mutation, because remember, Tumors are mutated cells. Imagine if you inject an mRNA vaccine or tumor-killing shot into the tumor and then somehow it mutates and it creates proteins that we have never been naturally able to resist as human beings. I think that is something that is scary here, and it kind of feels like we're playing a little bit too much with our biology. I do think that we need to try to solve cancer. Obviously, if I didn't think that was the case, then I would be a absolutely terrible person. I would have no moral code. But should we really be trying to do it by completely tinkering with the mechanisms inside our body, not just providing an, outsor- an outside stimulant like immunotherapy or chemotherapy? I-, I don't know. It feels like you're kind of playing with the tools of God a little bit there, and that may come back to haunt us. It also could work out really well for us, and I don't want to discourage 
this research just because I feel like it could be dangerous because a lot of things are dangerous and we have to take risks sometimes to innovate and create new things that will help a large amount of the population who deals with cancer. But it is something that you should keep in the back of your mind when you hear about some of these stories and you have genuine questions about the risks. Is this safe? They're doing tests on mice right now. They're not necessarily approved for humans yet. And they can't even guarantee that you'll see these same results in humans just because you see results in mice. So we'll see how these different trials go. Keep your eye out for it. Keep researching it and see where they are in a few years. I bet Israel will take it up because they are one of the leading medical innovation countries. And we'll see if they get any good results out of there. With all that said, and I know it was positive and negative today, but we're going to end on a really positive note. It is our daily delight. And this one comes from Laughing Squid. Two tiny baby stouts meet for the first time. Quote, wildlife artist Robert E. Fuller found two tiny abandoned baby stouts, and he named them Whisper and Stuart. And these guys, these are really, really cute. If you're wondering what a, a stout is, it's basically a tiny little weasel. And they, they're adorable, I promise you. If you want to see the video or any of the photos, you can find it in the link in the description below. But I'll leave that towards the end because that's my normal plug. For now, let me read you one more quote from the article. Quote, at less than four weeks old, Whisper was abandoned by her mom. Robert cared for her around the clock, but what she really needed was a friend like her. Then another baby stout named Stuart came along. End quote. And I'll leave it there. If you're curious, you want to find any of the videos or photos from this article or any of the other articles from today, there'll be a link in the description below that like and subscribe button. Also down there, you can find the link to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcasts, Podvine, as well as the Twitter handle at Your Daily Flip, where, as I mentioned earlier, I post Twitter tirades every once in a while talking about random issues that I find important. There are no quotes. There's no scripted part of it that I'm pulling from articles. I'm just going off the top of the dome about issues of the day or just something that really popped into my head when I was running in the morning. All right. With all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.